Well, welcome to the DNK Repos Non League Show, and uh, we're here for the next uh, couple of hours. And of course, uh, to, to my left, uh, joining me uh, as usual is he, Keith. And uh, welcome, Keith. You're right, mate. Good week. Yeah, I'm good, thanks, Dave. All good. Nothing, you know, nothing's changed. Carry on, apart from there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel and a couple of nice sunny days, which I can't play golf at, which is lovely. Apart from that, <laughs> brilliant. Can't go to the pub garden. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, joining us, uh, joining us for a second time, of course, he's uh, Southern Vice Chairman Anthony Hughes. Welcome, Anthony. Hi, Dave. Uh, of course, uh, nice to see you all. Uh, Northern Premier League Vice Chairman Keith Brown. Welcome, Keith. Thank you, David. And uh, the man that's looking a bit grey since the last time we uh, we spoke. To him. Being, a oh being, being a Liverpool fan, he's probably going a little bit grey. <laughs> uh, Craig Johnston from the Vice Chairman. You're always you're only as good as your last game. <laughs> yeah, that's and we fair. were crap. But the results. <laughs> well, well, joining us tonight, we've got a list of uh, well, I suppose we should call it a rogues gallery, maybe I don't know, but uh, hopefully everybody that's going to be joining us tonight, we've got. Uh, uh, Keith from um, Keith Bonas will be joining us about 7.15. Uh, we've also got uh, Peter Val from Worthing at half past seven. We've got Sam Wright at quarter to eight. Uh, we've also got um, a gentleman from Paul Town going to come on at eight o'clock. Uh, 8.15, David Faulkner's coming on from Redditch. Uh, 8.30, Kevin is coming from Wer uh, from uh, Wear. And at 8.45, Ali, of course, from uh, Craig Wonders will be joining us. And hopefully Dave Anderson was going to pop in for a question at seven, if he's not on the Guinness, I think he might well be still on the Guinness <laughs> when he turns up in a minute. But uh, I suppose, uh, do you feel, you guys, I suppose my first question, do you feel a little, little bit less pressure now that it's all been sort of sort of sorted, just waiting for it to be, uh, you know, done by the FA, but do you all feel a little bit more, you know, sorted in your own minds about where, where we are with the season? I, I, I think that... Um... You know, the people, the main protagonists that were kicking off about we should carry on, et cetera, et cetera. Most of them have uh, come to the, the belief of everybody else that it was the right decision that uh, we, we come to in the end. Um, you know, social media is, is the main tool of their their grievance, so to speak. And, and I haven't seen hardly any negativity. There's a few supporters that have come out and said rubbish decision, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, when you consider... Most people on social media are looking for an argument or to try and pick holes. It's been pretty positive, really. Did you feel the same? Uh, yeah, Anthony? yeah, I, I, I agree entirely. There, there are obviously supporters who are disappointed, and I understand why they're disappointed. Um, this period of time has been so difficult for everybody. Everybody's looking at a, any sort of chink they can get to sort of um, open their lives up and. Um, and in terms of people's mental health, anything that can distract you from what's going on is, is, is a good thing. So I understand the supporters' frustrations, but, and I know I probably feel as I'm beating the same drum as last time, it, the club's views are so important to me. And because of the way that the clubs um, spoke quite clearly, then I think it has to be, have been the right decision. Yeah. Yeah, I think from, from our point of view, I think it's gone extremely well. Um, you know, the last time I was on this meeting, you know, we were question around the Trident link, etc. It's worked perfectly well this time, yeah. as it has done most of the time. And uh, I think that's a very important factor. And uh, in fairness, we aren't getting, you know, up in the north, apart from odd one or two. I think everyone's accepted that it's the right decision that's been made. And uh, mm -hmm. We've now got to look forward to next season. That's really how I see it from yeah. now. Yeah. I think most people thought it was sort of inevitable. That's why. But I think what has helped is is that the, the, the results were published what clubs wanted. I think that's helped a lot of people, even supporters yeah. that have sort well, hold on a minute, 63% did want it to finish well they actually wanted it null and void but and then the other two well 13 percent wanted to carry on and i think they've mostly gone oh well it's not the league and i think that 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 was a, a a good thing that people could actually see properly what what clubs put on the survey yeah, I suppose yeah one, you're right one thing away from the decision that's one thing we should be saying as well is a big congratulations to uh hornchurch getting through to the oh, yeah of the fa trophy and they uh 
they, they, I suppose Craig will be on the blower giving them some advice for you, Craig. <laughs> maybe, maybe of uh, what route to go and what hotel to stay in, but certainly not how uh, <laughs> to play, not how to know. They're doing a good job as it is. I don't think they need it. Oh, uh, yeah, done a fantastic job, in fairness, haven't they? Would you, I mean, as the manager, though, Keith, I mean, as Stimo, would you have been pleased to get Notts County at Notts County? I know it's the, big, the biggest game and the one they could have got out of all of them, or would you have preferred Hereford at home? Uh, you want to play at home, Dave, didn't you? Because you, you know you, that that you know you've got a chance to go go with Concord Rangers to play at Wembley at the same day. Um, so yeah. it's you know you, you're so close now to the dream, but they've done unbelievable, and and this, they've knocked some massive clubs out, Dave. So who says they can't go up to Notts County and, and and do the same thing? Um, yeah. But yeah, I think you would want anyone at home would have been brilliant. I think for him, yeah. I suppose the experience of going up there, a bit like your boys, uh, Craig, the experience will be second to none, won't it? Oh, yeah. It's a great uh, a great achievement, a great day out. Um, but I'm sure that Hall Church, obviously being a level above us as well, they'll, they'll be going there to win. We went there yeah. to win, but realistically, that was our cup final. I yeah. I personally think the lads of Hall Church and Stimo and people, they, they won't be wanting to go there for a good day. The only good day is, is is that they come back and they they've done the job and they're at Wembley. He's half got a team of a lot of experience as well, Dave. That I think will help him out a, a big time. You know, he's got better youth, but you know, with Sam Higgins and whatever's been there, seen it, done it. He's a goal threat at any level, and and I agree with I agree with Craig. I actually think they're mostly sitting there and think, look, we win, we've got a great chance of winning the old competition. Yeah. So their yeah, confidence is huge. It's huge. Yeah, it must, must be. And yeah, they've done it. Semi-final being one leg obviously helps them as yeah. well. You know, if it's over two legs, you, you've got to be looking at Notch County really. But over one, you yeah. know, any, anything can happen. They've done some. They've had some great results on the road. In fairness to them, in, in mm. the, the trophy, they've done exceptionally well. I, I think you're right. At this stage in the semi-final, I don't think it would really matter who they'd have. I think they they think they've got a fair chance of getting the final. Absolutely. And, and now, Dave, as well, they're, they're only looking just at that one game. When Notts County are still looking at, at playing games, you know, to it, and, and they could still pick little injuries up. And, and it, it could be the time now, that, you know, they've got a good time to prepare, do what they need to do, and, and everyone fit up, you know, they've got a brilliant chance. Yeah. Has anybody, anybody won the trophy at, at, at their level at step three? Yeah, I had this for the money when they were uh, members of the Southern League, certainly a few years ago, when the final was held at uh, Aston Villa, I think. I yeah, think it was Villa Aston Villa or West Ham. Yeah, Villa Park. I think Edness would won it. There was step three. Hutton, did they not get to the final one? Sure. As well? Or did they lose to... Was that Gray's beat them at Villa Park? Hutton all rings sure. a bell for some Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. yeah. Look, the one you must think of, Jacks for winning at Wembley Court is Matlock Town. Of Michael. course, of course. Mm. 1974 5. Yeah, we were saving like that for you, Keith. <laughs> I was only 10, Keith. Sorry? I was only 10. <laughs> You're ball boy. I'm <laughs> good winning and all that. Yeah, but it was, yeah. Wasn't that? We, we had, we had, funny enough, we had a conversation before we go on to tonight stuff. But we had a conversation, uh, I did on a Friday night with, with Courtney Dobson, who's the physio at uh, Cray Wanderers, and of course, that's a like Cray Valley. And uh, she was, um, yeah, of course, she, yeah. Was, she was at uh, Wembley, of course, in the last Vars final, yeah. She, she was the funniest thing about it was, I said to her, What did you enjoy the day? She said, Well, my biggest fear, she says, was knowing it was on the TV. Running across the pitch to an injured player on the far side, she said, no, "I didn't want to go arse over tip." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, it must be fantastic for your club to get this. I can't imagine it. it must be marvellous. Yeah, hey, he's still celebrating. He's the longest serving. Uh, <laughs> of all time. <laughs> okay, have you, got, have you got a question for the guys? No, no, I, I think we'd just wait to see, just in case I, I say what one of the others want to say, Dave, and, and, and we, 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 we uh, sort of, uh, I nick their limelight. So, I'm, um, like I said, it, here's Keith. Ooh. Now, the other Keith, we've got three Keiths. Brilliant. <laughs> Evening all. I don't like Tower Bridge. 
<laughs> the floor's yours, sir. The three guys are here. The floor's all yours. Oh, you're putting it straight on it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh wow. I, I asked a question yesterday, um, but uh, said it was already answered. W was there any um, ideas or concepts on any kind of replacement competition or subsidiary competitions like a cup competition or some kind of tournament to stick into the gap in between now and, and when the restart might happen. Anthony? Yeah, well, for us, I, I know that was down, Keith, good evening, by the way. I'm, my name's Anthony. And I, I I know that's down to the individual leagues, I think. There's nothing that's been discussed um, across the three leagues at the same steps. I think the individual leagues are going to consider and do what they uh, do whatever they think is right. And we haven't decided yet whether we would go down that route or not. I think we're going to assess the situation with regards to what clubs think um, and see how things pan out over the next few weeks before we make an actual decision. There were a number of clubs who, during the lockdown early in the season, in our league, tried to form their own little competition. Mm -hmm. And the county FAs, and this was around the Midlands area, the county FAs wouldn't sanction it. So they ended up having to just play a series of friendlies. Um, now, we were wondering if it was going to happen, we would rather it be perhaps under the auspices of our league because uh, officially, if you like, because we haven't held league cups this year, they could class as being sanctioned competitions if we if we, if we um, decided to go ahead with it. But I think it's got to come down to the appetite of the clubs and what the scenario is at the time. But it's certainly not something we've ruled out yet. Um, as I say, we haven't made a decision yet. I know some leagues lower down the pyramid have decided to do it and some haven't. And I think it's going to be a varied picture, to be honest. Yeah, I think a lot of it's based around can we have anybody in? Can we have supporters in? Yeah, is you're spot on. Is it That's worthwhile exactly doing it for the clubs? But we, as a league, uh, we discussed it at our ball meeting last week uh, and we have decided not to go ahead with an organised competition. Um, we're just leaving it up to the clubs if they want to play friendlies or if they can get... I know there was there was talks uh, in Sussex in particular, I think it sort of stemmed from Hastings who were interested in getting a, a mini league sort of going around about yeah. November lockdown originally. Um, I get the feeling and the feedback recently that there's not so much appetite. Uh, and I think clubs that I've spoken to are quite... quite a lot of them are... Let's let's bin this season completely. Let's get back in a bit earlier um, over the summer, a bit of an extended pre-season maybe, and, and hopefully have a good run at it for next season. Craig, can I can I ask what what, what was the what was the Easterman's reasons for not sort of thinking about having a cup or a mini league competition? What, what, why did you decide that? There was lots of there was lots of reasons against it, and not many for it as such. I think. If I give you an example of um, against, you've got player contracts, you've got registrations. What happens? Uh, when do you start it? Do you play it without fans? Do you wait until fans are allowed back in? If it's May, pitches, um, referees, costs, all-round costs. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. There was another big one in there as well. I'm trying to think of what it was. Uh, yeah, ground availability, obviously, in some clubs as well. Uh, do you, What format do you then run it? Do you run it as a straight knockout, which means some clubs would only get one game? Do you run it as a league basis? Um, and then the, the biggest one, yeah, that was it, is if you make it voluntary, then if you've got, for instance, over your neck of the woods, Cray Valley and, um, and VCD and... Uh, help me out. Phoenix. 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 Phoenix decide two of them decide to play and the other one doesn't, what happens to their players? Do they then all of a sudden want to play football? So they all go off to the other competitor. And then what happens? Do you get them back? The chances are as a manager. So you're almost, if you go ahead with that, and I would look at it from Avery's point of view, it's easier for me to speak that way. But if we said no, and Grays and Tilbury said yes, half of my players would end up probably going and playing for Grays and Tilbury because they want to play. And then you've got the problem, you've probably lost them. It'll be very difficult to get them back. So you're almost forcing a team that doesn't want to play to play because for <coughs> the players as well. 
Can can yeah. can also can can leagues? Do they have to go to the FA to set extra competitions up, i.e., you know, for different formats, or can leagues go off their own back and say, right, we're going to do this without going to the FA? I think if it's a cup competition, Keith, I don't think they have to know. Because I, I say that because our own league cup, we've changed the format so many times over the years and never had to gain sanction for it. Uh, we've also gone through the process of making it a voluntary to, to participate and never had to go to anybody to get it sanctioned. So the honest answer is I don't think so. Um, I think if we run in as a cup competition, we would be able to do that throughout with the, the auspices of the league. The other thing I think that is going to be a big factor, and Craig has alluded to it, the furlough scheme goes to the end of April. And I think the vast majority of the clubs have got their players on furlough. And will they want to bring them off furlough to be able to play in a competition, as Craig says, that may only last one or two games? Mm-hmm. And I think there's all those things that need to be considered. And I think for us, we haven't made the decision because we haven't had a board meeting. I think the next board meeting, we'll consider it and make the decision or decide to make it at a later date. But I think there are a lot of things that when you get to the nitty gritty, on paper, it sounds like an easy scenario and a great idea. But when you get to the nitty gritty, it sometimes can be a little bit more tricky because of the the detail. Um, But no, I don't think there'd be any problem in answer to your question that the league setting up their own cup competition. I think the other the other problem as well is you, you've got to be looking at player welfare as well because, yeah. you know, you can't train until the 29th of March and then I believe it's only in groups of six technically. So some of these lads won't have, won't have done anything for four months as well, which is far, far greater than any pre-season would ever have been in the past as well. So, mm-hmm. you know, to be fair yeah. to the players... You know, yeah. really, they need at least four weeks training before they even attempt to, to come back and start playing. Um, but ultimately, on the other hand, you, you also know that as soon as clubs can, there will be clubs out there that go bang straight into playing friendlies. You can see yeah. it a mile. 17th of May is technically the date, I believe, that we're allowed fans in at this stage. Bit bit unknown on yeah. non-elite, but that's the, that's the mm. figure. I guarantee over the country there'll be half a dozen friendlies being played on that day. Yeah, I think, surprised. I think from our point of view, <clears throat> David, Northern Premier League, we, we made our decision on, last Thursday that we're doing just like uh, the Eastman League. We aren't going to, uh, <clears throat> you know, arrange any matches at all. We've said no, that's it. We finished. And uh, again, it's because a you can't take spectators in. So consequently, you can't have your bar operating. Therefore, there's no finance available at all. So we just felt it was as well to call it a day and that's it. Ironically, I'm on a, a session tomorrow night with the Derbyshire County FA because they're looking at making a cup competition uh, starting towards the end of May and running all the way through June. Well, so that was going to be interesting because... You know, wearing a club hat, I just can't see where we would want to take part in that because you're getting your ground sorted out and uh, you want your players resting, don't you, really? I, so, I, I don't think the ground should be an issue, though, Keith, should they? Because if, if anyone's ground needs sorting out after five months off, then 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 they must have some serious issues. Um, but going back to it, sorry, Keith, that asked the question, if, if, if you, have you got any comeback? Do you want to... So add anything else? Yeah, I mean, I, I fully agree with a lot of the points made. And, and my everything I was thinking was geared towards when fans can be let through. Obviously, there is no point doing yeah. it unless you can get the spectators in. It was providing something sooner rather than later to get them back in for their sakes as well, and as well as getting an income into the club. So if we can run an independent competition, obviously with a ground like ours, we could yes. set up an open competition <laughs> and open it to any teams. Yeah. Um, that's a possibility, and it wouldn't necessarily have to be the first team squad. It could be, it could be the youngsters, could be anybody. Um, but it was just a question in general, really, to ask why the decisions were made. I understand fully, and I wouldn't risk our players' welfare. It's part of my training and what I do 
aside from that anyway, is obviously taking care of players. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just an interesting one. But nothing, nothing I was asking was relevant unless it was at the point where fans were allowed through the gates. There's no point in doing it otherwise. I totally agree with that. And, and, I, and I, th I think, Keith, that your scenario that you've just described is probably what may happen. That, that clubs will get together if it's possible and fans can come in and perhaps have you know, little opportunities of getting a few games together. I, I can see that happening because sometimes the information that comes through doesn't always come through quickly. As Craig said, it's 17th of May is the time at the moment, they're saying, for fans, and that's elite. What Does that reflect on us? Nobody seems to be telling us whether that's the same for us or whether it might be a bit earlier for us, which is possible, but it may not be. So I think it's how soon we get that information, really, that will allow anything to happen, really. Anthony, you were saying that you've got a board meeting, you know, still haven't had your board meeting. Does that put pressure no. on uh, the, the Southern League? The other two leagues have said, no, we're not going to have a competition. No, I don't, I don't necessarily think so, in all honesty. As, as much as we value the Trident um, approach, there are certain things that we do differently. You know, I'm sure the board will take on board the information from the other two leagues that they've decided not to and the reasons for it, you know, but ultimately I think it'll just come down to the opinions of the Southern League board. But, you know, I think before we decide, we'll, we will also um, assess some sort of opinions from the clubs and see what the flavour is out there about what's happening. So no, not, not particularly, not on this issue anyway. I think if we, other issues, maybe we'd like to, to uh, be heard as one voice, but I don't think this issue is crucial. Well, Anthony Mercer's come in and said Isthmian and, and the Northern Premier Leagues have made a sensible decision. Let clubs get their pitches tip top for the pre season game. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, listen, the clubs, as Keith alluded to, if we, if we don't have decent pitches and start next season, there's something wrong somewhere. Um, you know, under normal circumstances, we wouldn't. And when, when this was going on early in the season and people were saying, well, could we extend it to June? I think we were saying, hang on, if we start playing again, we don't really want to be extended into June because pitches will need to be looked after and get got ready. I think the one thing that has happened is that clubs have had the opportunity to get their pitches in good shape for next season. So that's fine. There are quite a lot of clubs, of course, and Merthyr being one, who've got 3G pitches. So... You know, there are certain games that could happen at any time of the year, in all fairness. Um, but, yeah, listen, this is why anything that does happen will have to be voluntary, wouldn't it? You know, if clubs do need that time to get the pitches ready, then they, they should have the right to be able to, that's for sure. So we go into next season and we, we know we're, we're playing and all of a sudden one club in any one of the three leagues all of a sudden starts having major issues with their pitch. How do the leagues look on that club? With the amount of time that you know that we've not been playing football, that they, you know they should have actually got their pitch in some kind of a decent, decent position to be able to play football on, but then all of a sudden they're calling games off, you know, left and right because the pitch ain't great. How do, how do the, how do the leagues then look at that? I think as soon as we start, it will be just the same as what it is normally any normal season. Um, you know. Clubs haven't got the finances there to go and, and do extra work on their pitches this year, that's for sure. So if, you, if you've if you got a pitch that's notoriously poor drainage-wise, unfortunately, I see it, it's, it's going to be the same next year. And, and if, as a league, we didn't do anything in previous seasons, then we certainly won't be coming down on them next year, that's for sure. OK. Now, I was just going to say... Go on, Keith, go on, if the um, Keith, stop. <laughs> No, I was going to say uh, that, that's the way we are. I mean, well, you've got to take into account, I mean, a couple of our grounds have had uh, flooding, <laughs> which has been quite oh, amazing, yeah. you know, um, because we've had a hell of a lot up, uh, up in certain parts of the country. So the, the pitches are going to be, you know, they haven't had the same wear, but obviously you, you, we'll treat them exactly the same as normal. And that's what we're doing. So, yeah, I think so. Yeah, and and I, you look at each case on its merits. To, to be honest, you know, I mean, it's more likely perhaps that the club will need help rather than a hammer coming down. And I mean, all honesty. Well, Dean Sawyer's come in and said, if the DCMS allow fans in from April the twelfth, then the league may have denied their clubs a chance to earn some good money with competitive cup competitions, or competition. 
question. What I would say <laughs> is... <laughs> Go on, Nancy. Sorry, I beg your pardon, Keith. What I would say is, if, if clubs... Clubs will, if that scenario were to happen, April 12th, clubs will have an opportunity to play games, whether they be friendlies, you know, organised competitions amongst themselves, or whether the leagues organise them. There will be an opportunity to play games, get crowds in, because I would imagine that if we do get to that scenario, April 12th, crowds are allowed in, and hopefully things are going well COVID-wise, I would like to think there's going to be quite an appetite for people to go and see a few games, whether they're friendly, you know, whether they're cup competitions or, or just generally organised competitions by clubs themselves. So I don't think we'll be denying them. I don't think it'll make a huge difference whether the, the league runs a, a league cup competition or whether there's a, a, a an organised series of friendlies amongst clubs. I think the appetite from people will still be there to get out for a couple of hours and go and see a game live. Also, you, you, you can't base a, 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 a range of competition on an if. Um, yeah. So, you know, I know doing well, but if someone, you know, you, you set all this up and, and you can't have, and also that, that secondary spend doesn't come in then, you know, you can have takeaway drinks, but if it's hammering down with rain, you're not getting any secondary spend no. anyway. So I right. think it's difficult, you know, to, to, to do that. Is something that we've always said, we've always said between the three of us that in order to get football restarted, fans have got to be allowed in at a certain level and we've got to have a secondary spend. And I, and I think by sticking to those guns, that was part of the reason why we were able in the end to get grants. And I know it's a whole different subject, but I think that's why partially we were able to get grants in the Winter Survival Fund um, over the last couple of months. I think that's part of the reason why the government in the end turned up our, our, our scenario of getting loans into grants. So Keith, I mean, how, how disappointed are you that, you know, that the league has been curtailed this time round, you know, and, and we've cause car short and being in, you know, in, in a good place like last year and this year. Got to be devastated. I think, um, well, like every club you're putting in the effort to get where you get. And, and we thought we were doing well and we were on a roll. And obviously the, the club's got ambitions uh, to get promotion. So it is what happens now. Where does it start again? And I'm sure there's other clubs asking that. So, but, you know, my, my, my wife's had COVID, unfortunately. She works for the police. So she's gone through a hell of a lot over this period. So I, I understand all of the things that have gone on and caused these scenarios and have full sympathy with, with everybody involved. But yeah, hearing from the players... I and mean, we've got players now want to go and play grassroots Sunday league because they can get a game yeah. of football. So the Didn't same thing, mm. go and get, you know, mm. and go and get injured doing that. And then come pre-season, you've got players that have, have injured themselves doing that. So the complications yeah. of the confusion and the mixed messages all the way through it have been mm. horrific to deal with. And even with our youngsters, mm. with the academies called off and well, hopefully they can go back next week. But again, that's the mixed messages. I work in the women's game as well. So I also operate with Charlton Athletic and we've played and carried on all the way through it. Uh, and ironically, we're playing down at VCD, Keith, your old gaff and the pitch is probably the best it's ever been. <laughs> but, mm. but um, you know, it's carried on. So there's so mm. much mixed emotions and messages around it. I just think getting that clarification of exactly how it's going to start and what the situation is going to be from the start, I think the sooner the better. Keith, okay, just going mm. to uh, just you know, it crosses over both things about the competition that I think um, Craig was saying about losing players and that. How many, how, how many players um, were, were were sort of looking for for step two football from your club? So obviously, I, I know some from Craig went on loan, etc., or looked to, and, and you see it on social media. Did you have that issue at, at Carl Shorten as well? No, funny enough, he, I mean, he put every player on furlough, and they seemed happy with that, and. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, he's quite astute, Paul. He's he's a fair chairman in that point with the players, and he put all the players on furlough, and we didn't get any that that wanted to break away. Um, they were all hanging on, hanging on, hoping that it was come going to kick back in. But um, yeah, I mean, I think just the type of players that we'd recruited this year, they were they were brought in for those reasons, and. Uh, Obviously, we've had players go 
during and just before, but not since this has happened, as far as I'm aware. I mean, I don't, certainly Pete doesn't tell me every single thing, but as far as I'm aware, we lost no players to step to. More likely they might drop down for a game of football now. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Well, Keith, thanks for coming on, posting your question. No really, really appreciate it, mate. And wish you and uh, Carl Shorten and yourself all the very, very best, mate. No, thanks, gents. Thanks for the info, guys. Take care. Thanks, Keith. Thank you. Take all the best. care, Keith. Take care, mate. All the best. Right. And as you can see, everybody, that uh, Peter Val from Worthing has joined us uh, in the bottom right. And, and uh, Peter, just in case... Uh, I didn't do it with Keith, so I do apologise, Keith. But above you, of course, is Anthony, Anthony Hughes, Southern League Vice Chairman. To your far left is Keith Brown, the Northern Premier League Vice Chairman. And of course, you know the gentleman in the middle at the bottom in Craig Johnston, the Eastman Vice Chairman. But away you go with your question or questions, mate. Okay, well, basically, obviously, it's a bit of a different choice in wording this season with what's happened. Um, so does curtailment mean we'll be starting next season from our current positions in the league, effectively a restart of last season? No. <laughs> it's a short answer. Sorry, Pete. Pete Anthony, uh, sorry, the short answer is no. And I, and I get there's been some sort of confusion around the word curtailment, but um, the, the short answer is no. We start afresh. The the results this season will not count towards next season, as far as we're aware. Um, I think um, what happened this season was that there were um, such a lot of events that came throughout the season that there were times throughout that season where people were calling, and this never necessarily come from the leagues or the FA, but there were certain groups calling for last season's results to count um, in order to, to finalise uh, a scenario where promotion or relegation could happen. Uh, to be honest, I never thought that was feasible, and I still don't. But I think all that's happened is we, we've gone and tried to get away from this term null and void, which is such a negative term. Um, and, you know, just in case any sort of scenario comes up that we want to do something differently, then I think it, it was probably the case that we wanted to give the opportunity for clubs to be able to keep their stats. If there's a guy who's scored six goals in four games and the club wants to keep those stats on the board, then we want to give them the opportunity to do so, really, rather than declare it another void and expunge every record completely. Anthony, just quickly, sorry, Peter. So, Anthony, just quickly with that then, and, and you said you wanted to get away with the, the, the words null and void. Why was that yeah. put on the questionnaire then? That's well, I suppose uh, I, I would imagine, Keith. Now, the questionnaire obviously came from the FA specifically through the Alliance Committee, which I'm a member of, so it was agreed by us. I think probably that was for clarity, Keith, because just for the reason now that Pete's asked the question. You know, thinking that the word curtailment might mean something from that different from null and void. And to be perfectly frank with you, I don't think it does. I think it, it roughly means the same thing, only with a different uh, a different word in. Um, so I think null and void was probably put on the um, survey to avoid any confusion that if the word curtailment had, that the clubs may have thought that it meant a different thing to null and void. And, we, and I think probably they wanted clarity so the clubs understood exactly what they were voting for. I think, yes, I, I, can't, I can't say any more than that, really. Sorry, Peter, carry on. No, 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 it was, it was fine. It, it, was, it just seemed a bit strange to me. Also, the announcement that there, might be, there could be movements on step four and below, but there was nothing mentioned about step three. I mean, obviously, no project non-league, uh, are trying to you know to push for a bit of evening up because that's what the FA yeah. wanted to do by the end of his season. So why is step four and below being mentioned in those terms and step three is not? Well, uh, do you want me to make a comment on that? Uh, yeah, go it's not Northern Premier League. I mean, they, they, the the reason why that's been mentioned is uh, as I, you probably know, um, the Northern Premier League should have had a step four division starting last season. And then also won this season, um, but because of what what had happened, then it, it hasn't taken place. 
So what they're still looking at now, and this is uh, really, it's the decision is linked through the uh, leagues committee, not not necessarily through uh, through our level, through uh, step three, step four. Um, but they are looking as to whether or not it's possible to create that fourth division, um, you know, which will join the Northern Premier League. So that's where we are. We then end up where um, we've got eight uh, step four clubs. Sorry, step four leagues. That, that's the thing. Yeah. And yeah, it's about creating the perfect pyramid, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Didn't, didn't, Mark, did, didn't Mark Ives, um, in his interview, though, say that obviously the FA wanted that to happen, but obviously with obviously now that clubs can go legal, they wasn't too sure if it would open up too big a can of worms across the board? I think that's yeah, possibly... I think, I think... Go on, Anthony. No, oh, sorry, Keith. Cra carry on, please. I was going to say, yeah, that is a possibility, but at this moment, all the FA are doing, FA legal, is saying if it is feasible. And really, you know, our view, and that's uh, all the Trident Leagues, you know, the view is right. If the FA say yes, can, can, you know, we can do it, so you, you'll move the clubs, then fine. You know, we as a, as a league will fully accept it. Would that, would that be though, Keith? Just moving seems in obviously the northern to uh, area to fill step another step four leagues, or a, a, sorry, in the southern, or will that happen in the southern and everything else that or the Easterman that people get juggled about? Yeah, it, it would be a case that the um, when, when it was first done, we had to the Northern Premier League. Obviously, we had to produce where the clubs would be coming from, etc. And it's set up where there's going to be three from the uh, Northern Counties East, through three from Northwest Counties, three from the Northern League. So that's nine. And then the other 11 come from uh, the divisions lower down the country. So, you know, the, the, the promotion from clubs right on the South Coast and whatever you, would still apply. So those 11 would come and they would drop into you know, different parts, the Southern League, some the Isthmian League. And then as you move up the country, then we, we'd end up with some from, some more from sort of the Midlands area, basically. So doesn't that open up, and this just goes to what Peter was saying then, that then there's there's a couple of, there's a spaces at step two. So then why can't Worthings and all that then go, well, hold on a minute, you've just done it for step four, and, and then we've had Jersey Bulls on, and then we've had others. Because I, I heard the, the chairperson of <clears throat> the Skeffle League, which is obviously below ours, talking about this on Saturday. And I was like, wow, this could be absolutely humongous. I, I think that's the case that this is purely looking at that one extra division and nothing else. That's what the FA are looking at. And it's not something we're... You know, pushing for saying it's got to happen this season. If it's happening next season, then then fine. But it's something that they are looking at. So nothing's going to happen, as far as I can see. You know, for promotion from step three to two and two to one, etc. That's how I see it. Yeah, just to endorse what Keith is saying, I absolutely agree with that. I think what's happened is I think if we step three and four leagues. Um, I think um, it probably we would have said we would have expected the reorganisation to take place the year after next. I think what's happened is as Lee, as Keith as uh, Brown has intimated, the the appetite from the leagues committee, which represents the step five and six leagues, and also the appetite from the step five and six leagues themselves during meetings that we've been part of. I think, to be honest, and I can only speak personally, surprised me a little bit in how keen they are to get the reorganisation done next season. Now, I believe the reason for that is that they think there's a bottleneck of clubs between Step 6 and the non-NLS leagues 
who want to come into the system but haven't been able to. I think they've received something like 150 applications. And because of that bottleneck, then they are wondering whether there's a possibility that the uh, extra division at step four could be implemented next year to ease that bottleneck. But I think, Keith, what you were saying is, is, the, is the salient point. It has to be able to be done, and they have to find a mechanism of being able to do it, i.e. deciding which clubs are elevated to step four, you know, without disadvantaging anybody else. And I think that's going to be the challenge of actually getting it done. As Keith has alluded to, the FA are going away and sort of investigating the possibility of if there's a mechanism that could make it happen, but it's far from certain yet, I would say. All okay with that, Peter? Yeah, Chris, absolutely fine, mate. Magic, great, Peter. Thank you very much for joining us. I really appreciate it. All the no, best. Thanks, for, no thanks, one. Uh, thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, my, shirt, my badge wasn't in shop. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take care, gents. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. And of course, joining us now, of course, in the bottom right hand corner, he's the longest serving Vars. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Peter. And you look after yourself. Bye bye. How are we, Dave? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I've had, um, <laughs> I've had a great afternoon. I actually, I've actually seen these guys that much the last few weeks. I'm putting them on my Christmas card list, you know, but. But I, uh, I and I and I also think that one of them, <laughs> I, I think that one of them sabotaged my son's car to keep me off the show. That's the theory I'm going with, you know. But uh, but I um, Matt, Matt, I, I want to ask him a different question if it's okay, give it. A, yeah, I'd it. like to, I'd like to ask the guys um not to speak on behalf of their leagues or their clubs, um which they do all the time. I'd like to ask their knowledge of. What they think will happen if a um, couple of scenarios, if in the national four or five clubs decide that they're not going to play, which is what's being hinted at at the moment, um, uh, do they think there'll be relegation? Do they think there'll be promotion? What happens if four or five clubs stop playing? There's three little, three little teasers because I've had a bad day. <laughs> what is that, Dave? On a step. One and two, are you talking about? Yes, yeah. What 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 I'm saying, Craig, is is just three sort of qu sort of questions of, of what could happen. The first one is that if four or five clubs stop playing in 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 the national, which it looks like it could happen, um, does that affect the promotion? And if it does, where does that leave the national? Um, do you see any chance of the north north and south thing happening? So that there effectively is relegation and promotion out of it. Craig, on a, on a personal level, I'm glad I'm not part of it because it's, <laughs> it's just it's just a complete and utter. We we say that you can't please everybody all the time, but this is this is no win, absolute no win for anybody in that situation. Um, what is the right answer? Well, I just listen. I there is your answer. There. <laughs> no, but there what's yours? What's yours, Craig? I don't think there is either. I'm just saying, what do you genuinely think the three the three things have? To, what does it do? If, the, if four or five clubs stop stop playing, what does that effectively do to the national and promotion for a start? Is that, do you think they go? No, sorry, Keith, I beg your pardon. The one thing I think we can be certain about, Dave, is that there won't be promotion from step three to two and relegation from two to three. I think that's no, no, I, no, I get that. No, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, sorry, I, I beg your pardon. In terms, of, yeah, no. in terms of one and two, it's obviously in-house for them in terms of between one and two. It is a, a, it's a desperately difficult scenario that's evolved over many months, hasn't it? And, and you know, they're dealing with... It's a tricky level, and I'll tell you my own personal opinion, and it is a personal opinion. It's nothing to do with the league or the well, that's, committee. No, sorry, Andy. Yeah. Andy that's what I'm right. saying. What, what I'm saying is, what I'm asking the three of you is to put your badges of, of your chairmanship. Of course. And your badges of your club to one side and answer it as, as, a, as a, a knowledgeable non-league person. 
So I understand. You know, so we're not going to we're not going to court this. I just want you three. No, of course. How you think it'll it'll pan out? Do you know what the biggest problem for me, Dave? The biggest problem for me is you're dealing with two levels of football. You're dealing with non-league football as step two, and you're dealing with full-time professional football as step one in the main. So you're dealing with the league is having to manage two different levels of football, which is extremely difficult. And you know, for me personally, I see the top level of non-league football now at step two. I think what happens in step one is very far removed from what we do week in, week out. Um, the they are in effect effectively on a par with football league clubs uh, and they're running big vast operations on on a par with that so um that is so far removed from where we are at step three i think the only clubs we relate to are the ones at step two now the difficulties have come from this elite and non-elite status you know i think if things would be handled differently at the start that we could have a different scenario now. My own personal opinion, and listening to clubs at step two might not agree with it, I think step two should have been doing the same thing as we've been doing throughout mm. the season, if I'm brutally honest. And um, Listen, that's easy for me to say. I'm not, I don't have to justify the decisions. I get that completely. And it's not a criticism of anybody. But I would have liked to have seen step two more in tune with what we've been doing and step one maybe more in tune with what's going on above them. Um but I think we've got to a situation now where there is, it is impossible. It's going to be impossible to please everybody. So you've got a scenario where step two does finish, and that's it. Step one carries on. Or you've got a scenario where do the 18 clubs in step two who want to carry on playing try and carry on playing amongst themselves? Would that be sanctioned by the FA Council? And would that be good enough for promotion and relegation? Would a National League club accept being relegated on the basis of this 18-team competition, if it went ahead, I don't even know if the clubs want it. There's so much speculation because we only know so much of what's actually going on within the National League. But I think Craig is right. It's, you know, we deal with problems week in, week out. I wouldn't want to be dealing with those problems because mm. I, I genuinely don't know at this stage how they come up with a solution. The problem, the problem you got at step two, it's, it's all been... Um, led, for want of a better word, by about half a dozen very big clubs or very ambitious clubs that are probably bigger than seven or eight of them that are in step one as well. That's yeah, the problem. Possibly, yeah. Ex, you yeah. know, ex-football league clubs that are now at step two that, yeah. are, that are desperate to get back not only to national level, but to football league. Um, yeah. So that's where it's, a lot of it's confusing, isn't it? Yeah, but yeah, listen, <clears throat> I get all that, guys. I get all that. <clears throat> and I'm smiling to myself because... Because you understand how difficult it is for the guys that, that yeah. are dealing with it, because you're very much in their chair at a different level, but you know that that you're so you're so concerned about their problem, you haven't given me an answer to my question. I'm saying, no. what do you think will happen? Just as a person, not as a, we're not going to hold you to it. What do you think will happen? Well, I, I'll, I'll say my view, uh, David. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and I'm very much going to follow on the line of what Anthony was saying, but in my opinion, I think the uh, North and South, they will not play any football, decisions have been made, shut the doors, and that's it. So they're out of the way. So to me, in other words, they'll follow exactly what we have now done, and it, it'll be a um, you know curtailment of the season. With regards right. to the Little League itself, then in my opinion, they will fulfil all of the fixtures and that's the way, that way they will get some promotion to the Football League. They will complete I, everything at that level. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And what about, guys, what about if, if as, be, as being sort of whispered, four or five clubs say, say they can't fund the rest of their campaign, what then happens to the league and, and indeed them? Just as a conversation, we're not going to hold you to it. You know, we understand that you you're speaking on behalf of yourself now and nobody else. But I'm well, just I, interested to see what you think. I think that step two, because it's been paused for the minute as well, it's going to take a lot longer to get them going. Even if even if there was to go an 18 club division, um, 
you know, I'm sure out there at 18, there'll be one or two that don't fancy it in a month's time yeah. because they yeah. realise that, what, we're, we're so far up in the north and we've got to go all the way down to having a walk at Louisville. Like, yeah. no, we don't fancy that at all. And, and we would have done it had it been four weeks earlier. And so that 18, I think, even if it got sanctioned, wouldn't be 18. It, it'd start coming down a little bit. It's already been stopped and, you know, it's... it's so I, I personally think that it, the likelihood of it starting in any guys is, is quite small. That then has a knock-on effect of step one, because any club then that feels, uh, do I want to carry on as a chairman, don't I want to carry on, that makes their mind up, really, because then there can't be any relegation, so they, yeah. they then drop out. So there could be a situation where there's half a dozen teams that don't play or want to play in the National League. Now, that puts, that puts a very strange situation on it. And I actually looked at the, at the fixtures and the league tables, et cetera, in particular with clubs like Dover, Kingsley and Wildstone, who, um, who are three that have made it pretty clear, I think, that they're probably not interested. And the whole table, the top of the table, completely spins around if you deduct those points off of them, as in if you wipe oh. the records out. Oh, I haven't, no, see. Right, I on I those three know. teams, off the top of my head, I believe yeah. it's Eastley have dropped something like seven points to, to those three teams, I believe. So all, they, they become big benefactors in that situation. Yeah. So it completely spins around. It, it, you know, and people are saying, well, you couldn't, you couldn't um, uh, what do you call it, take their, uh, expunge their results. Well, you'd have to, surely. But does that also mean then that the four teams, say these four teams that don't actually fulfil the fixtures, if I'm right in saying if that was a normal a, a normal season, would those teams then be sort of put down to step six down that sort of area because they haven't completed the thing, they'd be taken out of the they're taken out of the echelon altogether and moved down because surely if they can't complete their fixtures, then then surely then they would have to go they they would have to just be relegated one league, they'd be taken out and shifted out, wouldn't they? I think I think sorry, I think that the because I've did about twenty five of these, I feel like I could sit on a committee now. But but, <laughs> but the but I think the the, the, the wording is and, and make me correct me if I'm wrong. But the wording in the statement is just cause, isn't it? Yeah. If, you know, if you don't fulfil the fixture, you have to have just cause, David. Now I would say that any one of them would be saying, "Well, this is just cause because of the yeah. situation we're in," which you know. But I don't want to speak. I want the guys to answer it, and I. I I think Craig's made an unbelievable point I hadn't even thought of. David, I tell you, I tell you I'm, I'm a big cynic, as everyone knows. I, I, I thought that they, they stopped step two, so step one would get a deal from the DCMS and and they could carry on and leave them out to, 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 to write. And I still think now that will be the case. I even still think they'll all take this and they'll say it's loans and it most probably isn't. And, and all step two will get left stranded because they're not, as as Anthony said, they're not the elite elite, and that, that's what I think will happen. Yeah, it's. I think it's good. I know, uh, the, go on, go on, the national league, the national, the national league are in discussion with DCMS continually. I think, aren't they, about these loans and and the way the clubs could get loans without breaking the league rules? And I don't know the intricacies of their own league rules, but. Yeah, that, that isn't, I mean, when you're dealing with four or six clubs in the national division who are saying that, I suppose that is an option that could get around that problem, um, rather than having to finance the only step two as well. So I, I wouldn't rule anything out, Keith. I think that's a possibility. Well, Alan Martin, uh, the couple of you that come in, um, let's see where we are. Alan Martin's coming in. Surely it's better to start the season, uh, say the season next season, earlier with fans. Uh, Dean Sawyer's coming and said, do the leagues wish the word containment existed last year? That's an interesting one, isn't it? I think, um, I, I think if, I, I've mentioned this on the previous show, Dave, I think, you know, last season um, was a scenario I think we might have looked at differently if we knew what we knew now. Um, you know, I, I think that we poss possibly could have done a bit more to allow clubs to move. But I think we genuinely thought that we would be in the clear come August. 
and that we'd be in a situation of um, of getting a normal league season done. And I think, you know, to lose two seasons without promotion relegation is is been a disaster. I don't care, you know. I, I, ultimately, that's what it's been, and and I think the decision was right this time around. But you know, I think we're all much wiser. Um, and, and have much more experience of dealing with this than we did this time last year. And it, there's no two ways about it. They've been extraordinary times, you know. So we've got league boards, and Keith will know this, he's been on a long time. We've got league boards who believe that they're elected by the clubs to make decisions. So we make the decisions on the authority of the, that the clubs have given us. But we are making such decisions of such magnitude, i.e. stopping a season, uh, starting the season, um, stopping clubs actually trading, if you like, that we've learned, I think, that this season we had to go to the clubs and find out what they did. That's the biggest part, what they thought. That's the biggest lesson I think we learned from last year. I think if I had my time over again, I'd be looking to have done more consultation with the clubs last season to find out what we could have actually done. That's fair. Okay, uh, Anthony, can I, I, I'll ask you as well. What's with, with this containment and what you were saying, just say, heaven forbid, and it doesn't happen, but we do get an issue next season. Um, and, you know, you're basically saying, well, it, it could let us use this year's results. How much pressure, if that is the case, are the teams are re- that are in the relegation z- zones at the moment going into the new season, thinking, well, worst case scenario, this happens... We could be, we're in a disadvantage here because we could get relegated and the season hasn't finished. I understand, Keith. And and, and let me personally, and in and terms of what my league thinks, the unequivocal, there is no chance as far as we're concerned of that happening. There is no chance of us using the results this season in any way, shape or form next season. Uh, and I say that, there's another reason for that as well. Obviously, between the Isthmian League and the Southern League, we've got two clubs who haven't kicked a ball in Guernsey and Merthyr, not played one game. So there's no way in the world we think that that's going to happen or we will, we will allow that to happen. I'll tell you what I think. I think you are a cynic, McMahon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dave, over the last two years, anything could happen. Yeah. Absolutely. No, it is. Keith, yeah. I, I, I can't argue with that. <laughs> Well, Dave, Dave, I'm, going say- to spin it. I'm going to spin it and ask you the yeah. same question. As you've been involved in lots of uh, meetings recently and got a lot of knowledge from uh, <laughs> your chats, what do you feel will happen? Well, unfortunately, Craig, my time's up. I was only allocated 15 minutes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 listen, I asked the question because... It is a question without an answer, and and and, you're right. and, and I, I feel this is easy for us, isn't it? It's easy for us to sit and knock it around over a beer and sort of be big guys and make big bright sort of statements. But it is a terrible situation, you know. It yeah, really it is. is, and and you, you know, it, I understand that people see it in a selfish way, so. You know, if you haven't got the money, you don't want to play and you don't think you should be made to play. If you're top of the league, you want promotion because that's what you've spent your money on. And I see all of that. The only thing I don't see is is an outcome, you know. We've At the end of the day, like I said, we I wouldn't want to be in that position that they're in. But, you know, we as three leagues have had some huge decisions to make over the last 12 months and, and we haven't got all of them right. But we'd like to think no. that we've got quite a few right. Um, yeah. And it's, it's the way you go about things. If, if I'm going to, I'm going to be controversial now, I think the handling of the, the monies that were available at the elite level haven't helped the situation now. I, I From a personal belief, and it is personal, um, the amount of monies that was provided to clubs for three months of football, I think could have been spread better than that. Um, you know, to give to give some of those clubs that okay lower um, turnovers may be in there to give them uh, allegedly was it nine grand a week seven and a half grand a week tax free yeah fortunes you know when when you look at a club 
and, and there are a few of them in the step two in uh, uh, in step two that are probably averaging three four hundred fans a week or, or not a week again. You know when you when you analyse what income that is, and that's not every week. That's one probably every works out probably every ten days over the course of the season, and they've been getting seven and a half grand a week. 96 grand over three months. Some of those chairmen must have been rubbing their hands massively. So that that wasn't particularly, if I'm critical of, of, of the National League, that could have been handled better. And I think that would have extended the season a lot longer. Um, and you can all we can all be wise after the event, crystal balls, etc. I think everybody thought that that three months funding that come from from Sporting, uh, the National Lottery or wherever it come from, everybody thought that we were going to be back with fans. Yeah. And, and, and so what went on with DCMS and the government and the FA and the National League is, is uh, the people do know, um, obviously, but I think somewhere along the lines that that was in the back of people's minds that we will be out of the mess by three months so we don't need to worry, worry about it after that. So I think the yeah. National League have got to take a little bit of a, a look at themselves as far as they've probably not helped themselves in the decisions they're going to have to make and be found in in the next few months. Yeah, I, if, if I you would take I, that, I, if you take If you take that on further, Dave, that you remember the first, when the funding was first put in place, they had three months of grants. Mm -hmm. And then they were going to be looking again at funding if that was a situation. And when the second round of funding came about, if you remember rightly, the Winter Survival Fund said there was £14 million pounds worth of loans for our level, three and four, and £11 million pounds worth of loans for one and two. And I have to hold my hands up at this point. Um, it began to look to me like the National League, at steps one and two, would get their £11 million pounds in grants and we would be left with loans. And that was because of what we thought the promise that had been made at the start that they would be given grants for as long as they weren't allowed spectators now i kicked up a huge fuss at that point i have to be perfectly honest I, you know i got into a few scraps with people at the fa and a bit and 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 through the national league as well because i felt we hadn't kicked the ball since the start of november and we were having to fight for grants where i thought the national league would get them and we wouldn't. As it happened, it flipped on its head completely. And they never saw that come in. And I think part of that was the FA genuinely recognised our need. And, and by us kicking up a fuss, I think they genuinely realised that we needed some support. But I've often wondered why the National League's money wasn't turned into grants. And I can only come to the conclusion that it was because of the way it was handled the first time round. Now, I don't know if that's the case or not, but it's a conclusion that you can sometimes come to and think, well, somebody wasn't happy with the way it was organised the first time round. Because yeah, well, the money that we've had in grants, Dave, we, we haven't administered at all. It's been administered by the Sport England and the Football Stadium Improvement Fund. We've not decided who've had what, the amount. It's just been given to us. Clubs have applied, it's been allocated. And it's been a totally different process to what the National League had in the first three months. Well, I, to be fair, I've spoken to two, three, two, two, two chairmen um, of the National League. One of them actually a board member, um, and you know their names. Well, I, would, I wouldn't tell you their names because of what they said to me. And and they said, look, hand on heart, they were told there were grants, and it goes back to this. Mm -hmm. It's like the, it's like the the sort of D day where the, the yeah. minutes weren't taken in this meeting. And 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 the cases that yeah. they, they portrayed to me off the record would suggested to me that they were telling the truth as uh, because yeah. of the way they said it. I think, um, and, I think and, they and genuinely I think, believed it. Yeah. Yeah, but I do I do pick up on Craig's point and I think it is a good point. And I think, you know, because you know everybody's trying to rush through stuff because we're in a situation we've never been in. And the mm. grants are chucked at you to mm. help you out. And and there was no structure, no, you did, you did, you know, it was just seemed a bit rushed. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not criticizing people because we're in something we've never, it's never happened before. But but people should have been made more, um, they should have been able to, sorry.
sort of show what they're spending the money on, why they've used the money, where the the money's gone to. Because uh, as you say, Craig, it's a good point that they could have funded it further down the line. And I do also absolutely believe, speaking to everyone and speaking to the two board, uh, the two chairmen, that everybody thought it would be over in three months. Everybody, mm-hmm. me, you, the dogs in the street thought we'd have been all in the football. So there's lots of stuff we that we understand is has gone wrong. But but I, you, there's going to be a lot of upset people, no matter how this yeah. pans out. You know, yeah. all we're going to have to do at some stage is shut the door behind it and move on. So and it's easy and it's easy what we do and it. We can chuck things about and change words. Not I don't mean you three guys. I mean. I mean the three guys, Dave, Keith, and me, because we're oh, we're yeah. in the the, the the punditry game. I think the way you've worded your statements tonight tells me that you have to be careful about what you say because the positions you hold, we don't. We can cause a fight and a lift if we want, you know. And um and 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 and, and I'm aware of that, you know. Believe it or believe Dave, it not. Can I just make one more point? And and you know. The, the grants at the National League in the first three months. I agree with you. I think they genuinely believed they'd be having grants and were told they'd be having grants. I, I genuinely believe they thought that, whatever reasons. But think about the way that that money was given. You know, we've all seen different handouts for different parts of the economy throughout this crisis, including football and including the money that's been given to us. It is the only occasion that I can think of that a block of money is given to the board of a organisation and said, "You do it yourselves." Mm. I, you know, I think they've hung the National League out to dry by giving them the money and saying, "Get on with it." I think if it had been done structurally through DCMS or from, from, through the Football Foundation, the Football State Improvement Fund, whoever it is, then that could have distanced the National League from it, and a lot of the criticism that they've had to put up with wouldn't have come their way. I, you know, I don't know why the system that was used just said to them, here's £10 million, crack on, off you go. They aren't experienced in doing that sort of thing. And I think it should have been probably more professional people who were looking at it than the jo- job they were given to, to deal with. Well, someone's come in and said that uh, the step one got 84K, step two got 34K, uh, and teams like Notts County, Chesterfield, Yeovil, etc., got 96k. Right. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. And then the same person's come back. Sure. How, ca- how that, can you that take, month? That's a month. How can you take minutes of a three yeah. Yeah. parties. It's been uh, beyond comprehension that they haven't taken minutes mm-hmm. in there. Well, we've seen a freedom of information request, haven't we, in the media? Uh, that haven't been answered by DCMSs yet. So it'll be interesting to see what comes of it. No, absolutely. Definitely. Well, listen, Listen, guys, I'm I'm out of here. Okay, mate. Thank you very much indeed. You'll be pleased to know. Take care, Dave. Lovely Lovely to see you. you. (laughs) Take care, Dave. Look after yourself, mate. As you can see, we're joined by John from uh, Paul Town. And uh, he's got a question for you guys. Uh, go, go for it, Josh. Oh, um, sorry, hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, so I've got a uh, few questions. Um, yes, one, fine. Um, there used to be uh, a team called Blackfall and Langley in Southampton who competed in the Southern League Premier South along with Paul Snell. Blackfall and Langley had to withdraw from the Southern League due to issues. At the moment, the Southern League Premier South has 21 teams, which is an odd number, but a team doesn't play on certain dates. To make up an even number of 22, do you think it's possible to promote Sirencester Town up a division to tidy up even numbers? Anthony? I I'll come in and Josh, Josh Anthony from Ufa. Um You're right. We run, and I know the Northern Premier League run one less in one of their divisions as well because Drogsden pulled out midway through uh, at the start of last season. I don't think that'll happen, Josh, to be honest. I don't think either of those vacancies will be filled, and I think the divisions will run, run, run one less like they did this season. And I think that's purely um, in order to 
um, not favour one team against another because we've played so few games. I think, you know, it, it wouldn't, we firmly believe, listen, this has been a staple, promotion and relegation takes place on the pitch. And the, the last thing we want to do is sit in a boardroom and decide who gets promoted and relegated. So my, the other answer to your question is, I don't think the vacancies will be filled. And I think the division that your club is in, Pool, and, and my former club is in, will run with 21 teams next year. Of course, yeah. That sounds great, yeah. Okay. Um, second question is um, to help with more people coming through the gates and turnstiles, do you think it would be a great idea to have a few games on Sundays at either half past 12, half past one, two o'clock, three o'clock, half past four or half past five? And that is in any Southern League division or maybe just the Premier South. Or Premier, I mean, yeah. Uh, listen, for me personally, I, you know, I think we would listen to anything. What happens, Josh, is that the fixtures go out, um, and I think it's the same for the other two leagues. And if if a club such as Pool say, look, can we play this game on a Sunday? I think it comes down to what their opposition feels. So the, the the dates are sort of given to the clubs at the start of the season. If the two clubs agreed and wanted to play at a certain time on a certain day, the league would allow it. I think there's no question about that. I think it comes down purely to the clubs themselves. And, and I think very often, if clubs are travelling substantial distances, they've probably put plans in place for the players to be available on a Saturday afternoon or, or whenever that is. Uh, because they, they in advance of the season. They're, when those subjects come up midway through the season, sometimes clubs find it difficult to reorganise their playing staff in order to get them. But in terms of loosely, you know, I've seen many games on a Sunday and it does happen. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't rule it out. Um, I don't think it's something the league will incorporate themselves. I think it would have to come from the clubs probably. What about what about the Eastman and, and, and Northern? Would would you like to see more games on a Sunday or maybe even a Friday night? Because I know the Friday night experience has been done in in the Eastman League, and I know a few yeah. times, if I'm right in saying, Craig Avery, it, it went worked quite well. Yeah, that was um, we we sort of trialled it a little bit, I suppose. Um, but you got to get in early as soon as those season as soon as the season's fixtures are out, you you got to start sort of um, approaching clubs. You know, even if you're looking at a game in November or February, you've got to approach those guys early. So the, the management mm. of that team are fully aware. Um, and it's it's not always... The only time you can get it usually is if, if you've got a fairly local team and they see it as a benefit to them as well. So in other words, oh. you can reciprocate the actual uh, fixture. Um, well, Craig, we, we, we did this, uh, Josh, we, we did this when, when I was the manager at VCD with Phoenix over the Christmas period for the last couple of years. We changed our fixture to a Sunday because one thing, there is no youth football over the Christmas period. So the pitch yeah. was available, but also there was more fans. So one year we went to Phoenix, the second year they come to us and, and our gates doubled because of that. That's good. And that's great, isn't it? That's brilliant. And, you know, I think clubs should be more inventive like that and, and innovative. We It was something that used to happen regularly in South Wales. You can imagine, can't you? The rugby season would come. The internationals would come on a Saturday. Always used to be 2.30 Saturday afternoon. They're not anymore. Merthyr would, as a secretary, I'd be trying to rearrange our fixtures for the Friday or the Sunday or to kick off at midday. And the difficulty was that very often we'd have Hitchin travelling from three and a half hours away, and they coming on Friday night was unreasonable. So very often it did happen on a Sunday, and we did that fairly regularly, and it, it was a bonus for us. But I, I, I think the clubs need to be more inventive. It comes down specifically to what clubs' needs are. If, if for example, Pool have a, a, a Premier League team close by playing on a, a Saturday afternoon, and, and they want to try and think of moving it to a Sunday, I think those things are all feasible. As long as, you know, other clubs are attentive to it. And I think Keith's right. If you can come to an agreement with both fixtures and it satisfies both clubs, I think you've got more chance of doing it. But we're up for that, absolutely. Of course, yeah. Um, a lot that's taken, but that's... Okay. Right, yeah. so we've, we've, we've pulled town, Josh. I mean, how long have you been a supporter down there? So at Pulled Town, I've been at Pulled Town since uh, 2016. Um, I've moved on to... Um, the um, 
football supporters drummer in 2018, and um, oh, I'm yeah. very enjoying it. Yeah, I mean, I take the passion uh, at Paul Town as um, I was inspired by two uh, football supporters of um, the names are. John Portsmouth Football Club Westmouth from Portsmouth in League One. And um, there's another supporter with um, a disability, um, special from me, shall I say. His name's uh, James Beardwell, and he is at, oh, it's. it's uh, we all know James well. Yeah. He was at Whitton. At Whitton. But... Whitton, yeah. Person, yeah. Yeah. Um, he's with DCFC, something yeah. about an Essex Alliance League. I mean, one day yeah. my, my, my plans are to. Um, to, to, to meet both of them and just to meet them, yeah. Yeah, that's we, good. You never know. We might be able to help. You. We might be able to help you meet James. We'll see. What we see for Definitely. We'll of see course, what yeah. yeah. Because yeah. Um, I know um, James like. Um, oh, how how can I put it? But he he struggles sometimes. But I know he doesn't mean to struggle. So. It'd be nice to just we, we, yeah. just we we'll get you we we'll get you in contact with uh, James because now he's doing away days as well. He come to Guernsey with us, um, and he must he come down. He must he love to come down. Yeah, he come to Guernsey with us. He will come down to Paul Town. I hundred percent know he will. And also as well, also the and I, and I the team that he he's a player in DTFC play at Harlow uh, Harlow Towns Ground, which is where I do all my stuff. Yeah. So, We'll see what we can do for you and see if we can't get you either to come down and meet DT and meet James or vice versa. We'll get James to come up and meet you. So I'll oh, keep cool. yeah. in touch yeah. with your messenger and we'll try and see if we can sort it out for you. Well, fantastic news. That that that, really? that is fantastic. Because, I mean, I remember really? James coming down to uh, Paul versus Wimborne, uh, Dorset Derby back in, I think it was 2019, but I didn't get a chance to say hi to him. So I felt a bit bad, I did, but... I'm sure something can be sorted soon. Yeah. Craig, Craig, Craig yeah. sitting there yeah. next door to you there on the bottom line. And he, he told me a funny story once about uh, James when they were down at Millfield. If you remember what that was about somebody coming back and uh, and uh, telling you to shut up and it was only one player. Oh, yeah. We had a phone call from a, a local resident um, about the noise in the ground at one of the games. Can you keep the supporters down? And it, it was James himself. <laughs> 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 Unbelievable! Uh, top draw, okay. top draw. He's a great character, and we'll we'll try and get him. We'll yes. To you and uh, we'll pass it on to you, uh, Josh as soon as we possibly can. Of course, yeah. Yeah. We'll pull it out for you, and we'll, we'll get that. But listen, mate, we appreciate you coming on tonight. You keep mm -hmm. doing your football and keep doing that, and we'll say we'll try and sort it out. Keep in touch with me on Messenger, and we'll try and sort it out for you. Of course, yeah. Thank you, David. Yeah. No, no worries. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for coming on tonight. We wish you all the best. Take care, Josh. Take care, Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Do, do appreciate it. Bye, -bye. Thanks, mate. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. And there he goes. Well, that's, you non -league, that's not that's non league football, though, isn't it? Yeah. He's a, he's a lovely young man. So, yeah, we'll, we'll try yeah. to put out for him and uh, I'll see if I can contact James and see if James will. Uh, We'll do something anyway, so uh, and, and we'll sort it out with him for the, for that. But uh, Dave Faulkner's just texted me, said thanks, come up. Um, and I have got a he sent me a question, so I'm just trying to to try and find that question for it. Um, <laughs> uh, if not asked already, I would love to know what provisions are in place for a potential COVID lockdown in 2021, 2022. And when is the season likely to start? Is it going to start earlier? than previously thought. Craig? Um, I'm not sure that it's definitely been agreed yet, but we're looking at August the 7th or the 14th. Um, so it'll be either one of those days from what I can make out. Um, on the lines of, is there any provisions put in? I think all three leagues are very keen that, uh, as we were, to be fair, this time last year as such, that teams know exactly where they stand before a ball's kicked. And I think that's never been more important um, this time round because it was important last time and, and it didn't happen. But after the debacle of this last, um, this last season, then it's even more paramount that uh, something is actually made public to the clubs and, and supporters so they know exactly where they stand. 
Yeah, we're, we're exactly the same with regards to uh, either 7th or 14th has been talked about. And again, it's something where we have got to be careful because like a lot of the players, um, relatively young, I bet of them, a lot of them won't be getting their first jab probably until late July or even early August, you know. So just hope the season is going to be able to start fine around those dates without any doubt. Yeah, I think that, that's right. Just to, to reiterate what the two guys have said, we're in the same situation. I think Craig is right. We have to get contingencies in place. We have to build in periods of time that we can use if we need to. We have to build into the rules some contingency plans in terms of if we need to change the format of the competition. But the most important thing that all those things must be in place before the ball is kicked. You know, it, it's we, we have to take away the um, requirement of clubs to vote for situations where their own situation, their own league position could be under threat. And and so we, we want one place before the ball is kicked and everybody's on a level playing field. With that, and I know Dave's been a, a, a big, big plus of it, did you all think about the season starting early? Because obviously, you know, with what we've had with COVID, obviously, and they're saying that you're better off in the summer months, you know, we could have some sort of relapse or in the winter we don't know nobody knows was it something that, that each league discussed or was it just not even on the table no it, it, it certainly was kicked around in in the alliance um where all three leagues have a representative um the, the reasons why i think we decided not to go for it probably many but the one that sticks in my mind is that you for clubs the amount of weeks you play they takes the amount of weeks you pay, if you like. So we didn't want to put extra burden on clubs of having a young playing season where they have to pay six weeks extra wages, potentially. So what we thought was the best scenario would be to try and complete the league season at the normal time, but have in place a contingency where it could be elongated if it had to be and use that if necessary. Um I think, I think, but it, it certainly was discussed. Yes, it, you know, it's something that was on the agenda. But I have to say, uh, it wasn't something that that anybody was particularly keen on. So, I mean, I know a lot of people said that you know it was like a contingency plan. Why was there not a contingency plan put in at the beginning of this season? Is there something yeah. that you three leagues are going to get together with the FA and or are the FA going to put some kind of you know, in stone contingency plan before the start of next season so that everybody knows if this happens, then this is going to happen. If this is, happens, that's going to happen. Is there going to be something that you think that they might they might do this year just to put people's minds at rest going into the season 21-22? That's certainly the plan, yes. No question about that. We've discussed that already. So that's been investigated at the moment. It's like everything else. When you get into the detail and the nitty-gritty, it becomes a little bit more complicated. But that doesn't mean it can't be done. Um, um, you're right, last season we intended to do that and there were various different reasons why it never happened. I think, as I mentioned earlier, we're learning all the time and I think we are more determined now than ever to get that cast into the regulations and the rules before the season starts. So yes, we have already tasked the FA executive with looking at that sort of potential scenario. But it's like everything else, you have to see what format that takes. So you don't know when that's going to kick in. So the other thing we're trying to do as well is we're trying to get a scenario where everybody has two blocks of fixtures and we try and play each other once before the second, before any, you play any team twice. That may not be a perfect scenario because of clubs that are knocked out the FA Cup and FA Trophy and trying to rearrange games. But where we possibly can, we want to try and play uh, half of the season first uh, so that every club has played each other once. And then if things happen throughout the season, I think we're in a far better position to sort of come up with a solution as we're going along. And I'll just, just so you know what I was doing there, I wasn't uh, ignoring it. I was actually texting young James while we were, while we were there. And he's, yeah, he's put back, yes, that sounds good. Really would look forward to that. So we'll, we'll see. Excellent. Excellent. Out for, 
for him. And as you can see, now we've been joined by our next guest, and of course it's Kevin <coughs> down in the bottom right-hand corner, and uh, he's probably been hit uh, one of the hard te in the teams in, in the Isthmian League has been hit the hardest, I suppose, uh, through uh, the COVID issue the last couple of years. So, Kevin, the floor's all yours. Evening, gents. Hope we're well. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah you're, you're not wrong. Um, it's not going to be a rant about that. Um, I'm not smoke to bowl. <laughs> Um, I actually did speak to him when you, when you said, did we have a question? Um, we did have a good chat and obviously we met on Saturday and just trying to plan ahead for next year. Um, and I think someone in the chat's just asked something similar. Um, and the first guest tonight touched on it a little bit. Um, so in terms of like the phrase that a lot of the, the supporters use, like winter shutdown, um, where do we stand on that? I'm not talking just the virus. Um, obviously those that know where's ground three, four, five years ago, winter shutdown was a regular thing um and in, just in terms of training space you couldn't train you couldn't play games um at all and there was a six-week period between december and january where we would often not do anything at the club um and obviously you've got people that are saying look covid's not going to go away you're going to have flu in the winter you're going to have all these types of things has there been a conversation um obviously we're we're in the league craig with craig um in the Ishman, has there been a conversation across the board or within the leagues of maybe playing not so much earlier games, maybe midweek games later in the season? I know we have bank holidays. Um, and something that we touched on with Paul um, at Ware was, are we going to bring back the group format for the League Cup? That was something we found beneficial um, two years ago now when we were in it. Um, and I know a lot of clubs have a different view on that. Um, but again, it's, it's more football earlier in the season, and they've got FA Cup and things like that as well. Um, can we now turn our attention to getting more games played, maybe at the start and, and at the end of the season, to avoid this winter shutdown? Well, I think we, we spoke about League Cup again very briefly at our last meeting and, and what do we do. And I think <clears throat> because Step 4, most clubs that you speak to at Step 4 still want more football than what we're actually getting in general. You know, 38... A 38 game league program um, under normal circumstances if you go sort of uh, a couple of rounds in in most cups sort of thing there's still a lot of midweeks available where people want to play so the league cup went down quite well on a group basis before and I believe if we kick off on time then I don't see any reason why we wouldn't run the league cup as we did before on a voluntary basis on on a group basis as well providing football for, on a local basis. Those games were played very early in the season. Um, because when you look at it, you've got, you got, what, 38-week season. We've got 38 games. We've got bank holidays. Um, there's not a lot of midweek football there. And I know that's different. And I, I'm only speaking from the Ishmael League because I know the other two guys geographically, I think the Northern League are, would rather keep midweeks sort of a, a, a premium as such. Um, from what I hear. Um, so what they do, and I, I think in the past, Keith, you haven't run a League Cup, have you? We we have, yeah. Oh, you yeah. have? Uh, right. Yeah, we've had the Integro, but we dropped it off this year. Right. Yep. You know, we didn't, didn't have it this year. Um, it's it's going to run uh, this next season, but what we're looking at is um, sort of midweek to try and make sure we get six midweek games early on in the season and start the League Cup slightly later. In other words, get the league matches done early. You know, as you said previously, we're trying to make it where we play each team, you know, plays one another um, in that first uh, tranche right up, until, uh, right up until Christmas. And that's why we want to get the uh, league. <laughs> the so that's what we're planning to do at the moment. But nothing decided, yeah. and I think it won't, won't be until obviously we, we know that we're kicking off when you know August 7th, 14th, sort of thing. And I think yeah. then the decision will be made. Then, yeah, I think that's a good break. point, though. Sorry. That, that Sorry. Kevin was saying, Craig, that uh, and, uh, again, we've had Ben Smith, who's the main manager, say basically the same thing that you know, if if you the first six, seven weeks, as Keith's just said, you, you're playing. Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday to cram all your league games in first. So if you did get this 
break from October to November or this. You, you, they are you. We are up to date with games. Mm. So what? The, so so the question is that you'd rather play Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday early on league games. Wise, is that what you're saying? That's what Kevin and and Ben's asked. Yes. So then you're then you've got a lot of Saturdays at some point during the season where you've not got games. Well then, then couldn't the league cut take that preference? Yeah, it could do. Just on that, mate, Just what was the feedback a, on? Sorry, Keith. What was the feedback on the group format of the League Cup? Was there much? In general, quite good. Yeah, people. I would say there were more people in favour of it by a long way than there was against it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we see we see a lot of, um, including ourselves, really, a lot of clubs locally um, and in the Isthmian looking for friendlies come yeah. middle of November. Yeah. Um, obviously, dependent on the pitches, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a lot of call for, for friendlies midweeks where they'd had four or five midweeks on the trot with nothing, no competitive yeah. football, and just to keep boys ticking over. I know not everyone has got a reserve side of a 23s. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting. It's something that benefited us greatly. Mm. I, suppose, I suppose, as well, off the subject a little bit, but while you're on, on as well, of course, you, your club, as well as Gray's, looking for physio. We're still looking for the physio? We are, yeah. Thanks for, thanks for putting that out there the other day. Yeah, we are still looking. Um, we did have um, we did have one last year. Um, she's moved on to a new job. Um, we've had a couple of others in the pipeline that have gone into professional football and things like that. Um, so, yeah, anyone that I know is Ali been on or I know Ali's coming on, um, anyone you know, anyone you can recommend, send them our way. Yeah, and it will do. No, it will do. But I mean, with with that, I mean, has everybody got over the upset yet? I mean, Paul was uh, Paul was on the sort of like uh, had had the ump for quite a period of time, didn't he? Has he calmed down now? He's always got the ump. <laughs> <laughs> you know him as well as I do. He's always got the ump. <laughs> but I mean, no, I think I think just in general, I think I think people um, at the club, obviously at first team level as well. Just looking forward to next year. That was kind of what the question was was based about. We sat down on Saturday and tried to work backwards from a proposed start date, middle of August, um, and tried to work out what we're going to do, how how many sessions we do need this year, obviously because of the amount of time off, how many like trying to put together a games program um, to build up to it. Um, obviously, it might be where well, it's more likely to be something that goes on for a while longer this year. Um, I mean, I can't speak for all clubs, but I know some clubs are doing video sessions and, and things like that. But real training and real real game time, you can't really beat it. Um, and it's obviously putting together putting together a plan and, and seeing how much football we can we can get in and how quickly we can get up to speed again. So to get, if, if the actual league then, say, was to start August the 7th, say that, that was the earlier, earlier one of the two dates that Craig mentioned, how as sort of... Uh, Chairman of clubs and secretaries of clubs and managers of clubs and coaches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How um, early would you be looking to put your first pre-season game in? When you, you know, because of the fact that you've not played for quite a long period of time, when would you? When would you guys realistically be looking to put a friendly in? If that was the case, that uh, we started back on August the set, August the seventh, would that be the first Saturday or the first Tuesday or the first Thursday in July? Yeah, I, I think that's pretty much the, because what we try and do, um, you know, a lot of the clubs, you get support from uh, one of the football league teams. And if you can get one of them coming, then that obviously is, is a key factor. And obviously that, their season started off on the 31st of July, isn't it, I think, this year, if, that, if that's the, the date. EFL, um, EFL. Yeah, so we, we, we sort of tend to look around uh, between the 9th of July onwards, really, we like to get them in. So, I mean, the other question, of course, would be, and I don't know where Keith would sit with this as well, because of the fact that if that's the case when we get to June, whatever the date is in June, and everybody can go away on holiday again and be cool, go abroad, and it's all happy days, how does that affect non league football then going into those friendlies in the first few games of the season? If all of a sudden your players are thinking to themselves, well, hang on a minute, the missus wants to go away on holiday. We ain't been away on holiday for two years, so we're all going to go away on holiday. Well, I'll, I'll answer that, Dave. I'll get on the phone to Kevin Paul and say, we'll play you in Spain. <laughs> I mean, I mean, 
No, I agree. That is my preferred start date. My personal preferred start is the 14th of August. Um, I, I just yeah. think by bringing it forward early, you, you, you're running into supporters on holiday, um, fans on holiday, uh, not fans, players on holiday, etc. It's um, my, my gut feeling, my, my own feeling is, is the 14th of August should be the start date. Craig, um, do you... Do you think that, again, I know Ben Smith just come back as well, just going over what I said about the fixtures and I think what Kev was saying about playing the league fixtures early. And Kev, um, Ben's just said, well, they only played one midweek fixture by November. But if I'm right, and, and again, I don't know if this is going to happen, didn't the FA put the FA Cup and trophy in bang, bang, bang straight away? Are they looking to do that again? Are they looking to try and sort of take over your fixtures more than, you know, is that in the offering? I think, as far as I'm aware, it's it's back to normal from uh, the yeah. FA Cup. It only that only happened purely because we lost what the first six weeks of the season this year, yeah. and the only way that they could get it back on track, so to speak, was to play the FA Cup. Was it every ten days? Um, you know, the the other issue is is that we don't need an ex, an extended season any longer than normal, as Anthony said, from a financial point from the clubs. And the fact now we're we're not having trophy replays and FA Cup replays, then there's more midweeks going to be available as well. You know, I, I can remember in the FA Trophy we we had uh, the run last year. We had three replays in the FA Trophy alone. Mm. Now that mm. that hits you quite hard when you lose three midweeks that potentially are league games or, or you can jiggle it around a bit or even a, a break if you've got a lot of games on. But the FA Cup going back to normal should allow well, will allow more midweek fixtures. <clears throat> and do you, do you know if the trophy will go back to normal as well? Because didn't that start early? Mm, mm, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure we start the, the cram through runs in, in December, didn't we? To, mm. to try and bring it back up to date. But I think it'll probably go back to normal, uh, Keith, to be honest. I think they'll both, both go back to normal because we're hoping that things will be a normal season. That's the hope. <laughs> and, Going on to what Kev had said, it, what we found in the last 12 months, and I know Keith probably has found a similar thing, but it is going to be different for Craig and the Eastman League. Our clubs are saying to us that they want less midweek fixtures, but our clubs have to travel probably a lot more in distance. So it's a tricky one because I think we do have to try and load as many league fixtures as we can in the early weeks of the season when the weather's good. Uh, 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 you know, and try and get as much played as we possibly can. So, you know, it, it's a different world now to when, when I was involved with Murthy years and years and years ago, you know, we, we'd, we'd travel to Kings Lynn on the Tuesday night and Margate, we'd, we'd be on the train all day. Clubs are not geared up for that any longer. You know, they, they don't really want the three hour journeys, two, two and a half, three hour journeys in the evening that we used to take as a matter of course. Um, so I think in future, I don't think there's much we can do next season, but I think that's something that's going to be coming far more on the agenda as we go through. But of course, the situation for the Eastman League is probably slightly different from the other two. I mean, on that, I mean, have the, have the three leagues looked at something along the lines of, you know, when you do your fixtures or whoever does the fixtures for the leagues, is that a case of sometimes you have to look at sort of certain fixtures? So, you know, like you don't want somebody say, if Roxham or Deerham are sort of in the Isthmian League, you don't want somebody having to travel all the way down to there on a Tuesday night. And yeah, you know, and then maybe in your case, Anthony, with Truro, you don't want to travel all the way down to Truro on a especially no. if you want to the funny one. thing, the funny thing about it, Dave, is that that is exactly what happens. The the fixtures are done by Atos, which is the same company that does the Premier League, the Football League. Uh, uh, and the, the National League, etc. So Atos do all the fixtures down to step three and four. And built into that is an uh, algorithm that allows clubs to say where the short are, where the longest trips are, which football league club they very often will be opposite, like to be opposite against. There's a lot of different scenarios that's put into it before the fixture compiled. Now, that's not to say they're able to satisfy everything but they try and get the best scenario they possibly can. So those things are all filtered into the fixture system, yes. And ironically, uh, Truro was one of our three shortest trips when we were in the Premier Division as Murphy. So we did go there on a Tuesday night, straight after the first Saturday of the season. 
But the good thing is, out the way, wasn't it? <laughs> I, 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 I'll ask, David, and I, I know because we've had quite a few people ask about this before. W- will the fixtures be different this year? Because obviously they were basically the same as the year before last season, weren't they? I think a lot of clubs wanted different different games. Yeah. It will be different, Keith. There, yeah. as the boys have alluded, alluded to already, they will be different. There'll be a new set of fixtures completely. And they will try and, and, and be done in two separate blocks so that where possible, every club will play the others once before they play them a second time. That's, that's roughly what we've tried to do in the past, but we're going to try and do it a lot more this season, hopefully, whether that's possible. But that, that's the intention, yes. So with that, if I was a manager, or, or and again, I, I say I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a sceptic, I'll be sitting there thinking, right, we've got to have the best start to the season because if it ever did get finished, we're only at, that they could do this on everyone's played everyone once. Yeah, I'll be I, thinking that. I take your point completely. I think, that, I think the thing to remember is when we did the survey of all the clubs and we had the results back on on it, whether we end the season or not, the the big the big figure that came out was if clubs couldn't start playing until April the 1st, there was 76% of clubs who thought the season should be finished. So that was the headline figure. But there were other, there were other bits of that survey. And one of those was the clubs were actually asked that if ever points per game were, were, were regarded as a, a solution to finding promotion location, what percentage of the league do they think they should be completed? And... You know, it was between 66 and 75 percent of games. I think that what came through clearly was that you know 50 percent of games would not be a solution. But what I think it might do, it might give us a better chance of putting alternative competition in place if that first block was actually done. Um, so I think it's one of the contingencies that we're hoping that we can build in to sort of create a suitable solution at the end of a season, if you like. It's not, I think, just a case of playing everybody once and using that. I think it's only part of what we see as a as a, a, a final solution. Well, Kevin, massive thank you for joining us tonight. We've got our final guest coming on and it's about to get a little bit crazy. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll let you go. And, uh, and uh, thanks very much. And wish you and Paul and Ware and that. Think, uh, all the best for the season. Uh, you Thank know, you very much. other than the two games at Cape, nice to see you, mate. Take care, everyone. Yeah, okay. Cheers, Look after yourself. Take care. Thank you, bye bye. And as I said, it's about to get a little bit crazy because I've got, uh, the final guest tonight is, uh, as she's now <laughs> named, one of the Cray twins. So uh, we, we, we will bring her on. So, uh, <laughs> we'll bring her on, and she'll be coming up very shortly. And of course, oh, it, there she is. There's Ali. How are we, mate? How are we, Ali? You okay? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Not too bad, mate. Not too bad. So, Ali, have you got your West Ham onesie on? No, I haven't. I've, I've put it it's in the wash. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what that it meant. Was, it was very stinky. I thought we were sweating over Tony Gale, I think. So I had to give it a bit of work after. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, don't, uh, if you don't know what Keith's talking about, especially probably Keith and, and Anthony, we'll do a show on a Friday night with Ali um, and uh, Emily, and we had Tony Gale on. And of course, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, a West Ham fan, so uh, it was it was good fun. It was a uh, it's yeah, great fun. The very long you know, drop, yeah. Unfortunately, I can't name drop someone like George Best today. Unfortunately, <laughs> but um, I'll try. <laughs> so go on, Ali. Hit him with He's a no, good like, guy, Tony. Good guy. Yeah, he's amazing. I could have spoken to him all night. I'm yeah. sure he was sick of us fighting. Yeah, good guy. Good guy. <laughs> so, um, first of all, I hope, hope you guys are all well, um, given what's going on at the moment. And um, obviously, I'm a physiotherapist, so I'm going to come at it from a physio very much biased. I'm sure you know what I'm going to ask and things I'm going to be asking about. I think the one thing we can all agree on um, from this COVID situation is that it's given us a newfound... Um, and reaffirmed the knowledge of our importance of, of having a strong medical care for our players and our, yeah. and our teams. Um, I think what we can agree on is that without our players, our leagues don't function. That's, that's unfortunately the way it works at the minute. So I think um, the main thing that I, I, I worry about as a physio is that I'm now in the unenviable position of next season looking at perhaps fixture congestion. I heard you saying about Saturday to Saturday. 
that made me want to scream as a physio, you know, and I've had months off about my players playing any football to going back to really uh, a really hectic schedule potentially. So I wonder what the leagues will be doing or perhaps lobbying the FA to do to help support physios or therapists that work at clubs or indeed player welfare. I think things like sort of transfer windows getting extended or getting looked at differently and looking at substitution numbers changing, maybe tightening up COVID strategies or making them more standardised. I wonder what you guys' thoughts were on that, sort of going forward next season for player welfare and helping physios out. <laughs> Well, hope um, if if I start, hopefully there won't be a fixture congestion if we uh, if we start when we when we, when we aim to, and we'll all be back to to normal and COVID's gone away and and doesn't appear again. That that'd be an ideal situation, wouldn't it? That'd be fantastic for everybody. I, I think as an NHS worker, um, I can wholeheartedly <laughs> tell you um, that it's a good chance it will not go away this year or next year. Um, it, it, I think, sadly, if we're governing what we do as a, as a country by how busy the NHS gets every single year, every winter we get busy, whether that's fractures, hips of hip neck of femurs, whether that's flu coming in, whether that's pneumonia, add a bit of COVID in, we're in crisis. So I think that we have to bear in mind that probably we might have this problem again next next Christmas. Or I hope not. I really do, because it, it breaks my heart. And I'm, frankly, I can't work any harder than I'm currently working. Um, you know, but I think we have to be half prepared that this... And what do we do to help our players, you know? And what do we do to maybe even lobby the FA, say, look, guys, this is what's happening in lower leagues. So not a league's been, it feels like it's been forgotten. You know, we don't have testing for COVID, for COVID in, in our leagues. The, the, the emphasis is on the physiotherapist, i.e. me, ringing up all my players before a game and saying, have you got a cold? Have you got a fever? What's been going on? Yeah. Um, and I think the East club's a bit less standardised than that, or a bit different. So what, what's your guys' thoughts on that, really, and moving forward for next year? If I, if I can come in there and mm. just say, we're not experts, we, we run the league, et cetera, et cetera, mm. we run our clubs, you people are the experts, health-wise, physio-wise, mm. et cetera. So I'd like to know, from your point, what you'd like us to do as a league, and then we can discuss it at ball level and take it forward for you mm. if you've got ideas. We, I, I'm no physio, I'm no health expert, et cetera, so I wouldn't have a clue where to start. But, you know, by all means, open the floor up. Let's get physios mm. talking. Your programme, Dave, on a Friday night, great opportunity to get mm. them all talking to the girls. And let's go to the leagues then with a plan from the physios and say, mm. this is what we think we should be doing as a league to protect our players, etc. I think that was kind of my second question was, do you ever think you'd have physios or medical professionals on your board meetings or in your committee meetings at some point? given what's happened this season? Well, everybody, Listen, has, yeah. all, all, all three leagues, anybody's more than welcome to uh, put themselves forward. Mm. The, the boards are, are run by volunteers, which are put there, mm. voted for by the club. So if, if somebody is, is in a position uh, on a board at, at their own club, then they can be forwarded, mm. uh, you know, when the, when the invitation comes out mm. to the clubs for uh, the, the positions for board directors who stand every year, then there's an opportunity for them to, to come forward. I think uh, Ali, uh, Anthony, it's from the Southern League, uh, the, the, the player welfare issue has come up actually mm. at, at, at our meetings at the FA and the Alliance. Mm. And, and the one, it's only a small thing, but one thing we have done, we've actually written it into the rules from next season on that we're not going to allow more than three games in an eight-day mm. period. It used to be a case in non-league football, you get the end of the season and clubs would have like mm. 15 games to play in four weeks and they'd be playing Saturday, Tuesday, Thursday. Saturday. We're not going to allow that any longer. We're only going to allow a certain amount of games in a certain period of time. It's only a small change, but it's a start. I think what you've said about getting medical professionals and physios at board level would be absolutely ideal. To get somebody with your experience and knowledge and qualifications coming to our board meeting and explaining to people on board what the situation is would be extremely helpful. Mm. The boards are run by the clubs. 
Oh, I'm sorry. That's what happens when you live in South Wales, Dave. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, wait, wait. The boards are run by volunteers at the clubs. And, and every club, obviously, probably gets... Um, every, every, it's better. Just to see if it helps the bandwidth. Um, getting professionals like yourselves on the board would be absolutely ideal. You know, we're not experts and we could do with all the expertise we get. The, I think there is generally far more acceptance now that player welfare is a huge issue. I think it's something that's been ignored in the past, quite frankly. We, we've not looked at it. We thought of, of people playing at our level as, as, as playing for fun and, and player welfare wasn't an issue. I think the world has changed. I'd love to think, I think you're right, I think COVID's not going to go away straight away. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping that we'll be in a situation come next season that the testing process will be far more accessible to people, clubs at our level. At the start of this season, the cost of testing was basically out of our price range. Mm. Now, whether we get to a situation, and I can see, you know, once the vaccines come out, obviously the the testing strips have, have become a lot cheaper and a lot more accessible. If we can get to a situation where we have to go down that route, I'd love to think that's something we can look at in the future. We we sort of dismissed it this year because it was out of our range, really, mm. at our level of the game. But hopefully, certainly at our level, I don't know further down the pyramid, but at our level, I'd like to think that those things will become far more accessible for, for clubs at our level. So, you know, I, I don't think it's going to go away, Ali. I think you're right. I think we have to build contingency periods into the season, if we can, to try and meet those goals. And, and I think we're all accepting that, you know, if, if if there is a problem next season, then we're going to have to adapt either into a smaller competition mm. where there's less games than a full season and try and come up with a solution that way to try and uh, uh, get promotion and relegation at the end of the season. I think everything's on the table at the moment. Anthony, you, you, you've, you've, you've sort of mentioned it and, and, and I know sort of the answer, but I'll come back anyway. And Ali's just said it and she said about the player welfare. But for you as the three leagues... And, and I would say this as a manager, um, five substitutes is a massive thing, especially at the moment. And I know some, some people out there, again, would say, well, if they come on, you've got to pay them. But everything can't always be put down as, a, as an answer to money. And, and, and Ali said, you know, player welfare is huge. So have the free league spoke either to the FA or that about extending substitutes next year? The, the truth is we have spoken about it. Uh, and I'll have to be brutally honest, it was dismissed as far as I'm aware. Now, that's not to say it won't be on the table in the future. Maybe, you know, listening to people like yourselves, maybe it's something we need to revisit. I get that completely. When it came to our league board specifically, they weren't in favour of it. Uh, and I have to be perfectly honest, the reason being what the club saw the cost of, of having to pay players if they are on the bench, et cetera, et cetera. I, I can remember when three um, three subs were introduced from five. That was the same argument then, but eventually we got there. Uh, and I suspect perhaps, you know, that could change in the future. But at this moment in time, I have to be brutally honest with you, we have discussed it. And it's not been something that certainly the Southern League wanted to take up on at the moment, and that was largely down to cost. Maybe slightly different scenarios with the other leagues. Can I ask them why, why didn't you put that on the survey for the clubs and ask them what they think? Because, like you said, this year, and, and Alice just said it, it, it is something completely different. We're not maybe even saying, you know, in a couple of years' time, once it settles down, then, you, you know, you go back to the three or whatever. But Alice's right. We're, they've been out a long time. There is going to be quite a lot of games coming up. For me, it just makes perfect sense, especially you can do it you know, in the FA Cup, you can bring an extra sub on, etc. cetera. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's a very valid point she's got. I, I think the reason, going back to the survey, Keith, the survey came from the FA um, and, and it was dealing with a specific subject, so I don't think that was even thought about, to be honest. But, listen, I take the point completely. I think, you know, I think when, when we initially thought of five subs, we were thinking of five subs from seven substitutes and increasing. But I don't think that has to happen, really. You can name five substitutes and you can technically bring five substitutes on, can't you? We, we name five now in the main. So 
listen, I think it's something that, that we could relook at. I don't, you know, I, I agree with you. Finance can't always be the overriding factor. It has to come down to the welfare of the players. I agree with that completely. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I think it's something we will revisit. And, I, and I'm happy to bring it up again at our board meeting in, in, before the season starts, actually. Uh, you know, I think it's something we should probably at least discuss before we, we make any decisions. Someone's just a, come in. Someone's just come in. Could we not, um, could we not, going back to what Ali was saying about the, uh, the board and, and, and so forth, someone's come in and said, could we not invite medical professionals as guests to a, yeah. to a board meeting? Um, and then Peter Bauer, who was on the show earlier, said surely the substitutes would be down to the, the individual club. So I, if, they've got, if they're allowed to use five, they don't have to use five. They can no, stop. and... And that's right, David. That's correct. We as a league canvassed our clubs this season, I'm sure, and it came back that they didn't want it. What we have got coming in next season is the, is the uh, concussion substitute. Yes. So we have got that ability for the, obviously, if need be, and hopefully that's never used, but we know it will be on occasions, but uh, that will be coming in next season. What you tend to find, Ali, is that what comes in in the professional game eventually filters down to us. But sometimes people are resistant to it because of cost implications. Eventually we get there, but sometimes we get there a bit slower than the professional game, unfortunately. I think you have to just look at it. The, I mean, I'll be honest, I'm a Cray Wanderers, and Cray's medical team is me. Psychiatrically, yeah. mentally, physically, everything elite yeah. comes down right. to me. I have to get my own sock tape a lot of the time. That's, that's yeah. non-league. And I think the yeah. problem is that last season I had um, three weeks when I had eight injuries. Um, I worked full-time, the boys worked full-time, and then I had three quite serious injuries on the bounce where one of them ended up in hospital who had a severe anaphylaxis, and we were away in Bristol. Week before, we were away in um, we were, we were at Portsmouth. Week before that, we, were, we had quite a lot of very far away games in midweek. Granted, that was because of FA competitions. And I actually, know. Although, granted, it's not technically a fix to congestion, but actually... It's a lot for these boys to go through. And I think that ultimately, yes, in, in one moment, yes, I don't want to use five subs because it costs money, but give it two or three weeks into the league, suddenly they've got eight injuries. Things look very different. I think it's worth having the options open. I think it's worth having a discussion again. I think uh, these are unprecedented times. We cannot yeah. keep saying that's enough, can we? And we never know yeah. what will come next season. It might be next season that nothing at all happens. I look like I've overreacted. I'm being a silly physio, you know, who's, who's counting all of my eggs before they've hatched. But I'd rather do no. that than have, have what I've had this year, which is frankly, and, and last year, where frankly, they were breaking down. I mean, Liverpool can't keep their players on the pitch. What, what hope have I got, yeah, you know? Sure. Yeah. In the nicest possible way. I mean, I'm brilliant, but still, yeah. I'm not that good, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Didn't, the, um, didn't the EFL only agree five substitutes for this season only? It is, but I think what I'm saying is, is that perhaps sometimes it's worth being on the forefront of these things. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, in my job in the NHS, we're having, to, we're having to think on our feet every every five minutes things change. We've now got a Brazilian variant possibly in the house. Now I have to sit there at work tomorrow knowing it will probably never come into my hospital, but I have to make mitigations for it and what I will do should it turn up in my hospital. I yeah. think it's worth being on the forefoot of this. I, mean, I think it's worth knowing that we've had two seasons where it hasn't finished for whatever reason. Right, each season a little bit different to the last. Let's not have a third season where the, the problem is all my players get injured because these lads have to work afterwards. You know, football is football, but if one of my lads breaks his leg, touch what he doesn't, and he's a PE teacher and he can't work, therefore, yeah, that's a very big right. implication to that gentleman, isn't it? Rather than just him being, he can't play football for, for six months, which is a bit of a nuisance, yeah. but ultimately if he can't work, that's, that's devastating to him and his family, or yeah. her family if it's a women's player, you know? That's, that's yeah, the listen, job, isn't it? To, to think about all these things, you know. Yeah, and and and, and that's why it's, it's so valuable to mm. hear what you you telling us. So, getting people like yourself to come to our board mm. meetings and reiterate the points will, will be invaluable. I think so. Uh, you've certainly enlightened us to one thing tonight. That's for sure. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad someone's listening to me for once. No one ever listens to me, apart from Dave <laughs> on a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> also, also, don't forget our league cup. Group basis was five from five as well. Yeah, yeah. I think it's just worth like, considering everything. I think that, I think that what I hear on Twitter, when you look at the Twitter tw um, or any comment that comes from Max and the poor Ismian League's um, Twitter can't count. It's just just get just get games played. What does it matter? And actually, there's so much more to just getting the games played, isn't there? Sometimes I mean, there's Post things that I would never think yeah. about as a physio, you know. And equally, you guys have yeah. got a really hard job as well. It's it's, it's that I think as the gentleman said before, there's no right answer. It's just a case of trying to trying to 
trying to cover your base as much as you can, isn't it? Yeah, it is. We all through this the last two years, we've just been trying to do what we think is right. Mm. And as Craig said, we have now always got it right. That's for sure. Um, but it's it's trying to do what you think is right at mm. that time. And then what we found this season is the goalpost change. You know, mm. the 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 rules change, the restrictions change, the regional restrictions change, and and it causes so much. Uh, uh, confusion mm. that is very difficult to have all the answers. But listen, there are some things that we should have in place, and there's no excuse for it, is there? And and that's you know, players' welfare is certainly, I think, for the first time ever, is moving higher up the agenda than it's ever been. Mm. I think it, it is, and I'm, and I'm pleased for that. You know, I think that ultimately yeah. we have to put them first because yeah. no one wants to see somebody get seriously injured. No, at all. No, not absolutely right. Well, oh, indeed. Be... Sorry, Dave. <laughs> I was about to say the time's run one away from us again, and the two <laughs> has, has, has disappeared and uh, very, very quickly. And yet yeah, again, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed tonight again in, in the presence of Anthony, Craig, and Keith, and of course, always in the presence of Ali and uh, Keith as well. Uh, it's been a fantastic night. I really appreciate your time again, uh, gentlemen, uh, for coming on the show. Sure. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Have you guys yeah, well done, gents. To, to have you guys on and speak so openly? It's uh, yet again. It's uh, it's been fantastic. Uh, me and Keith, well, we'll be back next week. Me and Ali and her cray partner <laughs> will be back on, uh, on Friday night alongside Emily. We've got Liam Ridgewell joining us um, on Friday night, so join us for that. Me and Keith will be back next week, and uh, massive thank you for you guys for watching uh, t tonight, and of course the shows on a Friday as well. Really do appreciate you you watching the shows, but uh, keep yourself safe, and hopefully we're broken the back of it, and we're going to be back in August. Fingers crossed. But for yeah, everybody, absolutely. good night. Do you think?